Consider this before viewing Peter the Great. Discuss the characteristics of a strong leader. Peter the Great had the ability to identify the weaknesses of his country and then act decisively to change them. As you watch the documentary, keep track of the many advancements that can be attributed to Peter the Great's strong leadership. Assignment Discovery now presents Peter the Great. On the vast and desolate plains of Russia, time has little meaning. A new age, the 18th century, is about to dawn. But Russia is frozen in time, and progress stands still. Elsewhere, great nations are rising. Holland is building the world's largest empire. Sweden is amassing an invincible army. But for the Russian people born to this giant land, Europe is a distant horizon beyond their imagination. Still, 1682 is destined to be a year like no other, a year that will force the hand of time to move the Russian clock forward. It marks the beginning of an extraordinary rise to power. The rise of Tsar Peter. A towering six feet seven inches tall, Peter will make equally colossal changes to bring Russia in line with the rest of Europe. But the task will not be easy. A nation of eight million peasants, Russia is a relic of the Dark Ages. Isolated from the outside world, the Byzantine domes of the Kremlin reflect centuries of resistance to progress and reform. The palace of the ruling Romanovs stands a resolute symbol of the unshakable domination of the Tsars. They hold the power of life and death over millions. Their will is law. But even in Russia's long memory, one ruler's drive for power is exceptional. The reign of Sofia Romanov began as it would end in bloodshed. In 1682, the reigning czar died, leaving two young heirs. Sofia seized the initiative. With a cocktail of lies and promises, she induced the palace guards, known as the Streltsy, to storm the Kremlin and seize control. Dragged from their beds and hounded like animals, Sophia's enemies are mercilessly butchered. Two witnesses to the brutality are Sophia's stepmother, Natalia, and her son, Peter. The ten-year-old Peter is the object of Sophia's wrath. The other possible heir is Ivan, who at 16 has a better claim on the throne, but his health is frail and his mind is locked in a simple childish state. With one too young and one too feeble, an unusual decision is made. They will share the crown with Sophia as regent. In a unique joint ceremony, the two young czars in waiting were anointed. But the clock was already ticking on Sophia's regime. In 1689, Sophia could stand no more. Seven years after taking power, her obsession with Peter erupted into paranoia. She was convinced he was leading a rebellion against her and in a chilling echo of her original coup, she called out the palace guard. Peter woke in the early hours to the nightmare that scarred his boyhood, the guards marching against him. But that was seven years ago. Then he was just a boy. Now he was the anointed czar. No palace guard had the courage to touch the embodiment of God on earth. Sophia might have the throne, but Peter had divine right. The guards abandoned Sophia.
Peter had not been planning a coup, but now that he had the opportunity to get rid of Sophia, he grabbed it. She was banished to a convent outside Moscow. She would never leave. Within a year of taking power, Peter took a wife. Named Yevdokia, she was shy and uneducated, but she proved a dutiful wife and bore him a son. He had a family, he had an heir, he had put his house in order. Now Peter faced a new challenge. Soon he would turn his back on a thousand years of Russian tradition and carve from the vast and rugged reaches of the East a new and powerful empire. The boundaries of Russia stretched from the icy borders of Sweden through the wilds of the Orient to the very edge of the Pacific Ocean. Of the 8 million people born to this unforgiving soil, 95% were serfs, enslaved to grinding poverty and harsh physical labor. Without end, without mercy, theirs was a life with little dignity and less humanity. Progress was pitiful. The peasants had no learning, few tools, and no vision of the future. This is the Russia Peter inherits, a country where people are locked in and change kept out. Only one place was different. Just three miles outside Moscow, a prosperous enclave of splendid stone houses identified the so-called German suburb, where most foreigners were consigned to live. Out of the German suburb came the most ingenious instruments. For Peter, they were both fascinating and frustrating. No one at his court could understand such confusing hoops of metal. But then the suburbs surrendered their greatest gift, a man with the power to explain. Dutch merchant Franz Timmerman brought the technology to life. He revealed the secret of a sextant, a device for mastering distances at sea. It could turn tides, winds, and waves into powerful allies. Timmerman filled Peter with dreams of the sea, and the Tsar never looked back. Peter orders five ships to be built on a lake 85 miles from Moscow, the nearest large body of water. He taught himself the skills of woodworking and labored hard under the guidance of European craftsmen. He took pride in what he learned and even left his mark. Peter set out on an extraordinary course of action. If a czar had left the borders of Russia before, it had been in the name of war. But now Peter was embarking on a different mission. He was going to plunder Europe for ideas, knowledge, and talented minds. In March 1697, he left Moscow. The pomp and ceremony was also left behind. Peter went first to the Baltic coast, to the Swedish-held city of Riga. Then his course turned southwards. A hurried journey through Berlin and Hanover brought him to his desired destination, the city he so desperately wanted to see. Amsterdam. Amsterdam is the richest city in the world, proof of the genius of the West. The city grew out of a swamp. By draining and damming, the Dutch held back the sea. The same feat of engineering was used to create homes the envy of Europe. Rows of houses bordered a network of canals that moved people and goods across the city. But the beauty of its architecture, the gentle sweep of its waterways, belied Amsterdam's strength. The secret of Holland's wealth was its fleet of 4,000 trading ships, more than every other European country combined. With Dutch ships on every sea, Holland enjoyed a virtual monopoly on world trade. Peter knew that here he would uncover the secrets of shipbuilding. To study the craft, he hired hundreds of captains and sailors, shipwrights and pilots, and sent them back to Russia. He bought his own set of tools. 
No ordinary shipbuilder would treat the Tsar of Russia as just another apprentice, so Peter kept his identity a secret. He signed on as a carpenter in the name of Peter Mikhailov. After four months, he completed his ship, the Peter and Paul. At the invitation of King William III, he sailed for London, where England's finest architect, Sir Christopher Wren, was building St. Paul's Cathedral. He visited the Royal Observatory to consult with the astronomer and borrowed ideas for coins and cannons from the king's mint and arsenal. The great embassy headed across Europe, through Leipzig, Dresden, and Prague, to the court of the Emperor of Austria. No other could rival Vienna for its gaiety and splendor. A worldly and westernized Peter prepared to learn a new European art, the delights of high society. But while still a thousand miles from Moscow, Peter receives chilling news. The palace guards are in revolt. He dashed home, stopping only to change horses. When he reached Krakow in Poland, he learned the rebellion was weakening. By the time the Tsar got back to Russia, 1,800 prisoners lay in chains. His generals informed him that the guards had rebelled against being sent away from Moscow to fight the Turks. But Peter was not satisfied that he was told the whole truth. Certain a larger plot lay behind the uprising. He would force the truth out by whatever means. Peter ordered 130 ringleaders executed. The rest faced cruel interrogation. The guards were interrogated six days a week for six weeks, but Peter could find no evidence of a conspiracy. Still, he hanged hundreds of rebels from the Kremlin walls. If Peter faced opposition from his fellow men, he was about to risk the wrath of an even greater foe, God and the church. The Russian church was the guardian of tradition. Life was governed by the toll of its bells. Although he was a conscientious churchgoer, Peter hated the church's opposition to change. The very day he returned from the West, he challenged one of its basic beliefs. To shave was a mortal sin because it defaced the image of man created by God. But Peter, like most Westerners, was clean-shaven. As his courtiers greeted him after his lengthy absence, Peter suddenly produced scissors and cut their beards off, beginning with the commander of his army. European dress was enforced by decree, and anyone wanting to keep their beard had to pay a tax and wear a small bronze medallion stamped, Tax Paid. Although these actions spoke of a man bent on change, they paled against Peter's greater plan, to put Russia on the world map. At 28, the Tsar at last had a fleet, but nowhere to sail it. So Peter looked west, towards Sweden. For 500 years, Russians and Swedes had disputed the territory surrounding the Baltic Sea. These lands promised access to Europe, and Peter determined to take them. Peter's rival was a mere boy, only 18. Charles XII, like Peter, took the throne in childhood. He shared Peter's appetite for conflict and built one of the best armies in Europe. The Swedes meet the Russians at the coastal fortress of Narva. Charles's army is exhausted by the long march. It's also clear that they are vastly outnumbered. For each Swedish soldier, Peter has four Russians. But audacity is Charles's hallmark. He storms the Russian position. In the face of savage opposition, his daring pays off. Victory goes to Charles. Russia is now open to invasion. Even Moscow is vulnerable. To defend it, Peter has to rebuild his army and re-equip it. With no raw materials, he did the unthinkable. 
he took the bells from Russia's churches and melted them down. Peter would turn holy bronze into a hellish array of new weapons. For many, it was sacrilege, but to Peter, it was progress. In the summer of 1701, Peter had a stroke of luck. Charles turned his attention from Russia to Poland, considered a more dangerous threat. The switch effectively left the smaller Baltic forts at Peter's mercy. For a single night in 1703, he bombarded the fortress at Nyenskans. It fell, and Peter had what he wanted, an outlet onto the Baltic. Peter felt triumphant. To celebrate, he announced that he would build a city. The land was wet and boggy, but fresh in Peter's memory were images of Amsterdam, built on a drained swamp. If the Dutch could do it, so could he. St. Petersburg was built on mud and bones. Peter supervised, watching every stage of construction from a three-room log cabin. He didn't see the death toll. He saw instead an emerging city with a fortress and a shipyard, a city from which he would launch his empire. But not everyone shared his vision. Russians were appalled at the spiraling cost in lives and money. When Peter ordered all the nobles in the land to build a fine stone house in distant St. Petersburg, the huge expense drained two-thirds of their wealth. Everything had to be imported, right down to the stones. Every arriving wagon and ship brought with it a fresh supply. Another shortage was residence. As no Russian would willingly choose to live on a swamp, the Tsar invited his court to move to the capital a perilous invitation to refuse. No one declined. But even as the city was rising, danger loomed on the Baltic. In 1708, the specter of Charles XII of Sweden returned to haunt Russia. If Charles thought he could pillage supplies for his soldiers on the way, he was mistaken. For over a hundred miles in front of the Swedish army, Peter had cut a swath of desolation. Villages were depopulated and destroyed. Wherever Charles turned, he found ruin. For Russia, no sacrifice was too great. In 1709, the two armies converge at Poltava. As the Swedes advance, their luck turns from bad to worse. Poor coordination among their generals leaves their main thrust outnumbered five to one. By midday, the victory is Peter's. Charles is forced to flee on a borrowed horse and seek shelter in Turkey. Never again would Sweden be strong enough to threaten Peter and Russia. Peter's final confrontation came not with a foreign monarch, but from within his own family. As a conqueror, he was unrivaled. As a father, he was a failure. His relationship with his son, Alexis, is cold and distant. Alexis is everything Peter is not, weak, pious, and conservative. Eventually, Peter delivers an ultimatum. Alexis must either make himself fit to rule or serve God as a monk. Alexis chooses a third option. He flees. He went to Vienna, then to Naples, where he hid. But Peter's ministers hunt him down and drag him back to face his father's wrath. To speak ill of the Tsar is treason. Peter grants mercy on two conditions. Alexis will keep his life, but lose his claim to the throne and he must name names. If Peter's actions were extreme, it was because he suspected a deeper plot.
Months later, Peter learned that his son, after taking the throne, planned to sink the navy and abandon St. Petersburg. Alexis is tried for treason and tortured. In one final act of defiance, Alexis died, probably from the shock of the torture, before Peter could sign his death warrant. The mold that made Peter, he had made himself. He had the vision to conceive great changes and the energy to carry them through. His reign was one of continuous territorial expansion. He waged war for 21 years, creating a modern army and Russia's first navy. He built harbors, fortresses, a new capital city. He changed the face of Russia forever. All this he did without borrowing a single gold piece from any man or nation. He achieved it with the sacrifice of his humblest subjects and ultimately of himself. In 1723, Peter was struck down by a chronic bladder infection and underwent an excruciating operation to remove gallstones. His recovery seemed complete and he resumed his grueling schedule, visiting fortifications on the Baltic coast. But a life of singular determination was ended by a moment of selflessness. In November 1724, Peter dove overboard to rescue some of his soldiers trapped on a sinking ship. He caught a chill which turned to fever, returning to St. Petersburg a weakened man. His old infection took hold once more. In unbearable pain, Peter begged for absolution for his sins because of the good he tried to do for his people. On the morning of January 28th, 1725, Peter slipped into a coma and died. What drove Peter to do what no Russian had ever done before? An engraved seal he carried everywhere bore the inscription, I am a pupil and need to be taught. He had the humility to learn with his own hands and the arrogance to believe he could teach a nation to abandon its past and embrace the future. The lessons from this giant man drove a giant nation forward, outward, and into a world that, as a consequence, would be changed forever. I see him everywhere, writes one Russian. I refuse to believe there was but one Peter, and not several. Peter the Great. Stay tuned. Follow-up questions, activities, and resources for Peter the Great are up next on Assignment Discovery. Now that you've seen Peter the Great, talk about this. When Peter was Tsar, he had absolute power over his subjects and created all policy. Discuss the decisions he made that impacted his empire. Based on the events presented in the documentary, decide whether or not you think Peter was a good leader. Now try this. Peter sought to modernize Russia. Today, many other countries have the same goal of modernization. Choose one developing country and compare and contrast its political, religious, social, and economic development with that of 18th century Russia. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to support Peter the Great. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Peter the Great by Kathleen McDermott.